On Pentecost this year, if you will recall, at about 1.30 p.m. local time, the young man whom we had just prayed for that morning died. This was Jordan Gennaro. He was 17 years old and his life is over. What a shock and tragedy this was for his family, his parents, and his friends. They are struggling with many, like many, and trying to understand why something like this happened. And now they have to deal with all this pain and anguish of the loss of this child. That is a question that many people ask over periods of time in their life at one point in time or another. Why is all this going on? How can this be happening? How do I deal with this? How do I, how do I cope with this? Turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Several years ago, you may even remember me talking about this. There was a lady named Joy who had a bad accident at the feast. And she was in another country. And as a result of this accident, she went through a lot of pain and suffering in the hospitals in the country in which she was locally found at that point in time. And it took them a couple of weeks to work out all the transfer arrangements, to pay for the tickets, to pay for the insurance and all that kind of stuff. By the time she was able to get to better treatment in this country, the leg had deteriorated so bad they had to amputate her leg. The interesting thing was people were amazed and how she kept taking each step in stride, not getting upset, not getting angry, uh, not worrying about the pain, not, not blaming anybody, not wondering why me, why me. She had stated that if it's God's will that she walk around for the rest of her life on one leg, then so be his will. She had developed such a good relationship with God that she was at peace, even in this very struggling, very difficult moment in her life. If she had the choice, would Joy have rather been healed by somebody because she was anointed right after the accident? Of course she would have. But she wasn't, and she took it in stride. She developed this relationship with God in such a way that she was able to accept her condition and she was totally at peace with this. Let's look at a lesson here in John 16 that Christ was trying to get across to the disciples prior to his death. He was pointing out that they can have peace in their lives as well. Let's begin here in John 16 and verse 19. John 16 and verse 19. Now Jesus knew that they desired to ask him and he said to them, are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? A little while you will not see me and again in a little while you will see me. The disciples had just been discussing this point because they didn't understand it. They had no clue what Jesus Christ was talking about. But then he goes on, he said, Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice when this happens, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. He begins to point out something that all of us can obtain encouragement from, and hope from. Even in our sorrows, ultimately he can and will bring joy into our lives. Then he goes on talking, giving, giving us an analogy that can sort of drive home the point. Verse 21. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come, but as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. And I know those of you ladies who have had children know what this passage of scripture is talking about, the pain of childbirth. And it had it not been that that kind of passage of scripture is accurate, nobody would have more than one child. But Christ knew that the joy that comes from all of that anguish and that pain and that suffering ultimately brings joy to your life because of what it produces. He goes on, he says, therefore you now have sorrow because I'm leaving but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. There's a dual prophecy here in a sense, but mostly this applies to Christ's second coming to restore the entirety of the earth. But he's also saying that you can have this kind of joy in your life as well. It is guaranteed, it is coming, and no one and nothing can stop it. 
which is the focus of God's holy day plan that we covered in a recent sermon. Verse 23, and in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, for whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Here is a very important point that Jesus Christ is making. Up until this point in time, this was not the procedure. The procedure was to go talk to Jesus Christ about whatever they needed. Christ is telling them now, I am giving you a unique opportunity. Once I leave and am resurrected and return to heaven, he's going to explain that later on. He said, you are now going to have direct access to the Father. He said, you've seen me pray. You've even asked me how to pray. You've asked me what I'm praying about. You asked us what, how I should pray when I do pray. Who do you think I'm praying to? I'm praying to the Father. You now are going to have direct access to that same being, God Almighty. And you can go to him, and now you can ask him in my name. You've got a double whammy going for you in a very positive way. When I was talking to the Father, I didn't have an intercessor sitting at his right hand helping me out. It was me and him, one-on-one. But look what he did through me by doing that. Now you're going to have him and me up there working for you. This is a huge, huge step. The beginning stage in peace and attaining peace in our life is believing and practicing this promise. Verse 25. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. Jesus Christ, again, is pointing out that we have direct access to God the Father. And if the Father needs clarification, or if Jesus Christ feels that he needs an amplification or expansion on what was being said, he's sitting right there on our behalf. He said, we are here to help you. We are here to make things work. We are here to make things happen. We know, and we'll see later, that Christ does sit at God's right hand and does intercede for each and every one of us. Verse 27. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and now go back to the Father. The cycle is going to be complete. Jesus Christ came to this earth served his purpose, opened up the gates for mankind to go directly to the Father, and now he's going back up to heaven to help out. His disciples said to him, See, now you're speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. We get it. What's the next words out of Jesus Christ's mouth? Do you really get it? It's a question that he asks him, sort of a challenge to them. And it's a challenge to us. We can get to the point where we say we believe these sort of things. We say we understand everything that's taking place. But as you've been hearing me say many times over the last several months, if we really, truly believed, if we really, truly had this kind of faith, our lives would change. Our lives would change instantly almost. Verse 32, indeed the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Again, pointing out a very important relationship. Jesus Christ said, I've never been alone, except for that one moment on the cross. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In me you may have the understanding, the belief, and the strength of faith to know and understand that we are here for you. We are here to help you. We are here to make things happen. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus Christ has conquered all the evil on this planet, including Satan himself. He said, really, and we're going to see here in just a minute, he's he's basically going to start telling us through Paul and others that you have the power within you to overcome all the same stuff I overcame. You have the same strength, you have the same knowledge, you can have the same belief, you can have the same faith that I had. Christ is trying to convey that there is a way to peace in our lives and joy if we come to terms with God through him 
Jesus Christ. This relationship has to be solid. We have to believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. We have to believe what Jesus Christ told us. We have to believe what God has promised to us and live our lives accordingly with that belief. Let's turn now over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. While Paul wasn't there that day when Christ had that discussion that we just read, he did later learn the same lesson, and he learned it directly from Jesus Christ. Paul really searched to understand the word of God so that it could provide him the peace in his life that he needed. He had to deal with, as you recall, a lot of trauma and tribulation as we've been reading as we finished that Book of, uh, Book of Acts Bible study. Paul went through a lot of difficulty in his life. And as we noted several times during that Bible study, Paul needed exceptional encouragement. He would get down. And at times, God, when he knew that he needed that, God would intervene and provide him the encouragement that he needed. God and Jesus Christ both know doing what they're asking us to do and to be able to have this kind of belief and this kind of faith so that we can have peace in our lives, it does not come easy. We are constantly challenged in the lives that we live. And sometimes those challenges start to get to us. And we get discouraged. We may even become depressed. We've got a challenge that we're facing that we can't cope with, we can't deal with. God knows this. Christ knows this. And he said, we'll intervene when we need to. We'll give you that extra boost, that extra encouragement, that extra help. Here in Romans 8, Paul passes along some of the wisdom that we might be able to utilize to have peace in our lives. He's talking about unwavering love of God for each and every one of us in this room. Let's begin with Romans 8, verse 28, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I think I've quoted this to more people in my years in the ministry than in any other passage of Scripture. Because once you come to believe it and understand it and know if it applies to you, you get a lot of hope being developed by it. Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And how do we love God? By obeying him, keeping his commandments, doing what he's asked us to do. And who are called according to his purpose. He has a purpose for each and every one of us. And if we are living our lives according to that purpose, sometimes that means not doing the things we want to do and doing things God wants us to do. That comes from heeding God. But then he goes on, he said, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God knew from the get-go who he was going to call. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the sequence of events that takes place in an an individual's life when God finally chooses to work with them. God says, I've chosen you. Now I call you. We can heed the call or we can ignore the call. If we heed the call, then we go into the the whole process of repentance and baptism. And coming to the justification, being justified by the blood and the the life of Jesus Christ. And then he says, after we're justified, if we stay on course, what we're ultimately going to be doing is to be glorified. He said, I've got this whole process worked out, and I want you to be there. I want you to make it through this whole process. Then we see how this peace can start to shape up in our lives. Verse 31. What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He's already made a major sacrifice. He's not going to stop now. Just as he worked intimately with Jesus Christ, he said he is going to work intimately with you. Work intimately with me. Jesus Christ needed a boost now and again, didn't he? Yeah, even Jesus Christ. When he was in the wilderness for 48 days and 40 nights, they said the angels had to come and administer to him to give him strength and give him an encouragement. Encouragement is what he received that night in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he went, got down on his knees to pray, to ask God if there's another way out of this, I, I, we need to talk about it. 
I'm not ready to do this right now. But then he got so intense about it because he was right on the verge. He was bleeding blood through his veins or through his pores of his skin. That's intense. So what did God do? God sent an angel to encourage him, to give him that little boost. God knows we have those needs. He's not going to let us go by the wayside. He's not going to let us just flounder. He's not going to let us just sit there and suffer forever. He's going to intervene on our behalf and give us the boost that we need to keep moving forward. Who shall bring charges against God's elect? Verse 33. It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Just like I said before, Christ is sitting up there talking to God daily about us. Maybe even hourly, I don't know. I don't know how that God thing works. All I know is that Jesus Christ is up there and he's got you on his tongue, talking about you, encouraging God to encourage you, to guide you, to encourage you, to strengthen you, to help all of us make it to where we need to go. We have a personal relationship going on with God, and sometimes we may not even be aware of it. Remember Jesus Christ told us that the Holy Spirit even knows that we don't even know how to talk to God. We don't even know how to pray to him. So the God's Spirit intervenes on our behalf and sorts it all out, makes the right words go up there, makes the right words make sense. And Jesus Christ is probably sitting up there saying, yep, got it right. That's exactly what he meant, exactly what she meant. We're not even aware of this. We're down here blubbering maybe away, complaining about this, complaining about that. Woe is me. How come this is happening to me and all that kind of stuff? And God's spirit's like, no, that's not what you want to be saying. (laughs) I know what you really mean, so let's interpret that. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the, the love of Christ? Shall tribulation separate us or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Jesus Christ has got all this under control. He said, I love you so much, nothing that you can ever go through in your life, nothing that exists or doesn't exist, nothing that's real or unreal, can separate you and me from that love. And he makes this really incredible term here, Paul does, in verse 37. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors. That term, more than conquerors, is a very unique phraseology in the original Greek. It is the word that is spelled like this in English, translated from the Greek. H-U-P-E-R-N-I-K-A-O. Hupernikao. Hupernikao. This word comes from two words. Hooper, meaning Over and above, and nikao, meaning to conquer. The word describes one who is super victorious, talking about us. Super victorious, one who wins more than an ordinary victory, but who is overpowering and achieving abundant victory. Christ's love conquered death. And because of his love, we are hooper nikao. More than conquerors. What Paul is telling us here, we have the power of God's Holy Spirit living in us. We have Jesus Christ living in us. We have Jesus Christ who conquered all. He said, I have given that conquering spirit, I have given that conquering power to you. Christ said, you can conquer all. Super conquering. Super victorious. In light of this understanding of that phrase, let's now read what Paul has to say next. Verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a promise. This is a promise from Jesus Christ and God through Paul to each and every one of us. But there is a catch. For this kind of a magnanimous promise to be made, basically Jesus Christ is saying, nothing can separate you from me. 
Nothing. I won't let it. Let's turn back a couple of pages to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Maybe some of you can remember an old television commercial. Not that old, but it's an old Saturn car commercial where the guy is contemplating buying a new car. And he keeps asking the salesman, okay, what's the catch? What's the catch? This is too good to be true. What's the catch? Well, there is a catch for us as well. Because when you stop and comprehend the promises that we just read, it's like there's got to be a catch. There's got to be a little caveat here. The catch for us is simple. It's simply believing. It's simply believing what God and Jesus Christ have told us. That's the catch. We'll see here in Romans 4, Paul explaining something about Abraham and his relationship with God and how it impacted his life as an analogy for us to think about in our lives. So we begin in Romans 4 and verse 17. Romans 4, verse 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations... In the presence of him who believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. This is referring to the promise to Abraham and the promise here for Abraham. And Abraham's looking at God and saying, you're going to do what? You're going to cause a nation to come from my loins and my wife? Do you realize how old we are? We're both past that age. We can't produce. We know that. We've accepted that. But God says, if I want it to happen, it's going to happen. Verse 18, who contrary to hope, in hope he believed. I mean, when he he looked at this logically, it made no sense. You can't look at life logically if you're looking at God intervening in your life. It's not logical. He said, in hope he believes so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, in other words, he was very strong in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. She was incapable of producing a child. She couldn't conceive. He did not waver on that promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Abraham's relationship with God God was so strong, he believed everything that God told him. He had faith that what God said would happen, so much so that he looked at this and said, I have no idea how you're going to do it. I can't wait to see it happen. He absolutely believed that it would take place. Abraham knew the promise of God. He wasn't sure how God would keep it, but he knew in his heart and he had a peace about him. Because he knew it was going to happen. If God says it, it's going to happen. He knew he and Sarah were not capable of bearing children. This is a testament to the power of faith in bringing peace to a person's life. Abraham had peace. And what did God ask him to do later on after his son was born? He said, now I want you to kill him. Only because you believe in the promises of God And only because you have this incredible relationship with him and have faith in him, you know that's going to work out okay. Take that one on for a challenge. Abraham was no different than you and me. He was a human being. We try try to make him up to be this superhuman being. He was a regular human being. He had frailties. He lied. It's recorded in the Bible. He misrepresented But God called him his friend because he really believed God. Authentic faith does not deny that the problem or obstacle exists. But authentic faith declares that both God and Jesus Christ are bigger than the problem or the obstacle. Paul then goes on with this explanation, the example that helps us obtain peace in our lives. 
not wavering in our faith and believing everything that God and Jesus Christ promised. Verse 21, and being fully convinced that what he had promised him, he was able to perform. In Abraham's mind, it was money in the bank. Fully convinced. When was the last time you were fully convinced when you went to God? How often are we fully convinced that the promises God has made are real in our lives? If we were fully convinced, we'd all be living our lives differently. We'd never ever worry. We'd never fret. We'd always be at peace because we know God's got it under control. Consider where you are today and where you could be. If you had total peace in your life, not one worry of any kind, not one fear. All of this was very real to Abraham. God, through Paul, is trying to tell us it can be that real to you. Verse 22, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Having unwavering faith was accounted as righteousness. It's as close as becoming righteous that we can be in this life. Developing that kind of unwavering faith. That's what God calls righteousness. Because we're finally starting to get it. Verse 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. This is all about us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. What is he doing? He's linking us right back to Jesus Christ. You're tied to him at the waist. He died for you so that you can have direct access to God and you could start getting your life on track. God has given us examples and we need to pay attention to them. And know that God can and that God will perform what he promises, and just like he did for Abraham and many, many others. I mean, think about what the attitude must have been like of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. To take the stand that they took as teenagers, they had to believe. They had to believe without a shadow of a doubt that God would take care of it the way he needed to take care of it. Same thing with Daniel. You could just name person after person after person. Joseph, when he was incarcerated. These aren't superhumans. These are people just like you who chose to personally make Jesus Christ and God their personal friends. How do you develop a friendship? You have to spend time with each other. You have to. You don't have a relationship if you don't spend time with each other. Talking, laughing, crying, joking, sharing. Let's go over to chapter 5 of Romans, continuing on. Where does all this faith lead to in our lives? Verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul just went through this whole setup. In this state, so he can make this final statement. He used the word therefore. Therefore ties us back into what he was just saying about Abraham. If Abraham can do it, so can you. So can you. And Paul's trying to get us to understand that. Because he knew God had promised and he believed him. Talking about Abraham. And Christ is our link. Verse 2. Through him also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. This is a process that is taking place in each and every one of our lives. The trials and the tribulations that we go through produce perseverance. I mean, I'm sure you've gone through things in your life or you've been around somebody else and they've gone through things and it was just like ongoing, 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 ongoing. Then finally they get to the end of the trial. It might have been weeks or months or even years. 
And people go up and say, how did you do it? How did you persevere for that long? Any one of us in this room can do that. It is not going to be pleasant. That's not what he's saying. He said, but those trials and those tribulations do pr produce perseverance. They keep you putting one foot in front of the other even though you feel like cucka. You feel like you just want to die. You don't even want to get up. You don't want to talk to anybody else. You don't even want to pray to God. You feel so miserable. But if we can just put that little one foot in front of the other one and take another step, another step, and by the grace of God get through another day, and maybe, as we heard in the sermonette, maybe somebody will come along and give us some word of encouragement or some word of hope or some word of inspiration, and all of a sudden you have a good day. That's what life's all about. We have our ups, we have our downs. But this tribulation keeps giving us perseverance, and this perseverance starts to develop into character. Character then is now becomes so strong that things that would have taken us down before, now we can handle with basically no problem because we're so much stronger. And because we see that happening in our lives and we should go back and look at those things, that starts producing hope. Maybe I can actually pull this off. Maybe I can actually become the person that Jesus Christ was. What did he say can happen? When I go to the Father, greater things than I did you will do. Paul continues, though. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. As you can see, this ties back to the day of Pentecost that we just celebrated recently. It all links together, and it's all integrally tied together. And we've got to keep ourselves embedded in God's word, praying to God, intervening with, with life any way we possibly can, tapping into God's resources, tapping into God's encouragement, tapping into God's promises to say, I know you promised, where's it at? I need it. Let's turn over to Ephesians 2 now. Ephesians chapter 2. We have the resources to accomplish virtually anything in our lives spiritually. How can I say that? Because, as we've learned through sermons, through the feast days, especially through Pentecost, we have the exact same power living in each of us that created the universe and everything in it. The exact same power. We have those resources, and it's all tied to the power of the Holy Spirit. We just need to learn how to tap into it more in our lives. Christ is our leader, our example, and the one who is assisting God in our development. He is not going to drop the ball. He's not going to make a mistake. Once again, here in Ephesians 2, we're going to have Paul, through his instruction to the Ephesian church, teach us more about how to achieve this peace in our life. Paul starts with an explanation about where we've come from, and we need to be reminded of that every once in a while, and what God has already done for us. Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. None of us can deny that. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of dis disobedience. We were there. Among whom also we all once, conduct, once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just like everybody else. But, the next word, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. God chose to intervene and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, 
that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God, in God's mind, this is a done deal. <laughs> He's already seeing you sit in grace, with, in the mercy seat with Jesus Christ, with him ruling here on this earth. He, he, can, he can visualize it already. He knows you can't visualize it yet. But you know, if we get to this point of having this peace in our lives because of this belief and this unwavering faith, I can almost guarantee you it'll be like Paul when he was taken in that vision and God said, here, let me show you a glimpse of what's coming up. And he took him to the throne room and may have shown him the plan of God unfolding in it before his eyes. It can become that real. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Remember when I said God was creating again? God is taking each and every one of us just like clay in his hands, like we heard in a sermon several months ago. God's shaping and molding and squeezing and pressing and sometimes even firing to get us to where he wants us to be. He knows exactly where to push, exactly where to squeeze, exactly where to shape, exactly where to mold to get us to where he wants us to be. And where does he want you to be? Perfect. Perfect. When he's done with you, he will be perfect. Just like Jesus Christ is perfect. That's where he's leading us. That's where he's taking us. We are his workmanship. Drop down to verse 13 of Ephesians 2. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Christ is once again identified as our link to God. He says, it's through me that you get to him. The means of achieving peace in our lives, and he said, I am it. You allow me to live in your life. You follow my ways, follow my lead. Allow me to lead you wherever I need to lead you. Don't complain about it. When you're going through a tribulation, just know you're developing perseverance. And as you're developing perseverance, remind yourself you're developing character. And as you're developing this character, remind yourself there's an incredible hope that can blossom out of that. Verse 20, verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man for the two, thus making peace that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. He said this natural nature that we have in our human bodies, Jesus Christ has conquered all that. <coughs> he conquered that, and that with, his, with his death, hanging on that cross. And he said that conquering that he did can apply to your life, just like it did to him. And you can get over all that enmity, you can get over all that rudeness, nastiness, meanness that exists in all human beings. And he came and preached peace to you, who are far off and to those who are near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father, and that is the bottom line. Christ made it possible for us to have access to God in heaven. When you send up a prayer, I don't care if you're sitting in your car, I don't care if you're walking down the street, I don't care if you're on your knees, I don't care where you, what you are, whatever you're doing. If you send up a prayer to God, it's a beeline to God's throne. And God the Father, the commander of the universe, if you will, the commander of all that exists, will listen. As long as our hearts are right and we're right with him. We can't be full of sin and expect God to listen to us until we've repented. Direct access to him. John 14. Let's turn to John 14.
our God who has promised to take care of us and provide for us and even heal us and love us is the God that we have direct access to. Belief and trust in God and Jesus Christ is where it all comes from. It may, however, take longer than we think it should. It may take a lot longer than we want it to, but it'll happen. Even those around us, when we start developing like this, will take hope in our being helped by God's intervention in our lives because they'll see it happening in your life. And you will give them encouragement by the way that God is intervening in your life. Before we end today, let's look again at Jesus Christ's own words here in John 14. Christ is responding to some questions and comments that are taking place with the disciples because he's talking about leaving them and they couldn't quite put the dots together. He begins here in John 14, verse 1, responding to Peter. This is right on the heels of Peter being told he was going to deny Christ three times, which he denied was going to happen. For John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. We must maintain that link between Christ and God. Christ is our source to God. The one who has given us the guidelines we need to be at peace with God the Father. If we are at peace with God the Father, fear of life, worries of life just disappear. Drop down to verse 25. This is a response to one of the other disciples' questions. Judas, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I've said to you. That's a mouthful. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's what being at peace is all about. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I am. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. Christ was constantly trying to reinforce their believability in what he had taught them, what he had told them, what they had heard in other places. Christ knew that it would be hard to go through this struggle of life and keep the faith. And to be able to be at peace in our lives, let alone be at peace with other people in our lives. Right here he said he's providing us the details, the information that will make it possible for us to believe. I tell you something's going to happen, you're going to watch it happen, and you'll start believing more. And be at peace. So get ready to wrap it up. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. There's one other aspect of being at peace with God that we'll look at through Paul's eyes once again here in Romans 12. The whole idea of being able to feel we're at peace comes from believing and internalizing the promises of God and Christ and their commitment to us. And wouldn't you know it, it requires something from us. It takes a life of action. It also takes a life committed to making peace with others as well when it's within our reach. Let's look at Romans 12 and see Paul's admonition in this regard. We begin in Romans 12 and verse 18. Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's not easy, is it? I know it's not. Paul knows it's not. Christ knows it's not. But you can get to that. You can get to that and actually feel good about it. If we believe everything that God and Christ have taught us. Because he said if you do this, something good's going to happen in your life. And if we believe that, we would do it, wouldn't we? One last scripture. 
Romans 15, just a couple of pages over. Paul, in his epistles, talked a lot about peace in us as well as peace with others, as we just read. It is linked to how we treat each other and those who have, we, we have to deal with in this life. It doesn't just concern us and our brethren in the church. It's how we treat everybody. It goes beyond these walls. You can't treat everybody in here nicely, and I know all of us don't do that all the time. I know that for a fact. But it talks about going outside the walls. You can't go outside and start mistreating people. You can't go outside and not try to make peace. That just throws everything else out the window. It is a new way of life. Talking about your enemies and doing good to them. That doesn't come naturally, folks. You know that. I know that. Paul leaves us with one final blessing here. I'm just going to read one verse of Romans 15. And he says in Romans 15 and verse 33, Romans 15, verse 33. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So let it be written. So let it be done. God is a God of peace. And he wants us to have it. There's a tremendously powerful message of hope in all that God and Jesus Christ have given us, taught us, told us, and promised us. Both want us to reach the point of being at peace in our lives. You know and your know knows that you know that it's going to work out just fine because you've trust and you've got a relationship with God and Christ that comes in trusting and believing both of them, what we've been taught, and leaving the things that we can't do in their hands. One of the toughest lessons I've had to learn in the last several years of my life is there's, I can't fix everything. And I've got to learn and I've got to allow God and Jesus Christ to pick up where I can't. You can't give it to them and take it back, though. You've got to give it to them and leave it in their hands. That's tough for all of us. But you know what? You can do it. God said you could. Christ said you could. Paul said you could. The tough part is, will we? Have a great Sabbath.